Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another session of Authors Afternoon. Uh, I don't have to actually tell you what Authors Afternoon is, and because most of you know what it is. But for those who are new here, just a bit about the foundation and the author and the conversation list and how we do it. Yeah. So, uh, as you know, Pravaketan Foundation is a non-profit trust based in Kolkata was founded by eminent literature and cultural activist, late Dr. Prabha Khetan, in early 1980s. Her vision of working for a better tomorrow is embodied in her famous words, Karm hi jeevan hai. A gathering where the written word breathes life and minds of both creators and enthusiasts intertwine. It is also a testament to the Foundation's unwavering commitment to social, cultural, and humanitarian causes. Today's session is presented by patron Sri Simon Limited as their CSR initiative, association with Taj Bengal, Kolkata, and support of the SRS Women. The media partner of today's event is My Kolkata. Now, it is my utmost pleasure to introduce author Satyat Nayak. Satyat, please come with Satyat Nayak is an Indian author, a screenwriter, known for his best-selling novel, The Emperor's Riddles, authoring the biography of Sri Devi, the eternal screen goddess, and for scripting Sony's historical television epic, Porus. His debut novel, novel a best-selling thriller, the Emperor's Riddles earned comparisons to Dan Brown for History Myths Mystery. His new book, the magnum opus Mahagatha, is an epic collection of hundred greatest mythological tales from the Puranas of Hinduism. Anand Nilkantan has described it as the must-have in your home library. His short stories winning the British Council Award and appearing in Sudha Murthy's Analogy Something happened on the way to heaven. Satyat is named one of the top 50 authors to follow on social media. Satyat is currently scripting a high-profile web series from Mythoverse and writing his next biography of another luminary of Indian cinema. In conversation with Satyat Nayak, we have conversationist Isha Gupta Vesh, the SRS women of Missouri. She's not only an accomplished professional in her field, but also a voracious reader. Relax, sit back, and enjoy the session. Over to you, Isha. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Isha, and I'm so obliged by Anandita's humble uh, introduction of mine. So, uh, I think you all must have had, had an idea about Satyar's work. So let's uh, have a wonderful conversation with him. So uh, Satyat, uh, it might be a little cliche question. You've been, I've, I've been, uh, you know, following you over web and uh, social media. So you've had many interviews, but yes, to start with, just uh, a brief introduction about your journey. So yeah. we all know you uh, have worked as a journalist with CNN and IBN. So. Uh, please uh, elaborate on the switch from journalism to being an author. Sure. Yeah. So um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Anandita. Thank you, PKF, for making me a part of the family. It's always wonderful to be at a gathering, especially in Calcutta. 
uh, because I spent five years of my childhood here. So I think, although I no longer live here, but I think a bit of an umbilical cord still remains. So it's always wonderful to come back to the city. There's so many memories here. Um, uh, you know, I, I kind of dread that question because um, it's like, how do you um, couch so much into so little? So because a journey is not something that can be kind of, you know, encapsulated in a few words. Uh, so I, I think I've grown up uh, reading and loving literature. I think my grandfather was a huge influence on me because he was himself a very well-read man. And uh, so I remember sitting on his lap and absorbing stories and poetry and songs, you know, and I think that was a wonderful process of osmosis for me as a child. So I think when you love to read, you also naturally, the organic step is that you want to write. You want to see if you could also put out stories that others would read. So I think it comes very organically from there. My mother uh, was a huge influence in the sense that she encouraged my reading habit a lot. She tells me that as a child, I was happier in a bookstore than a toy store. So I would probably go around. I would really want my kids to be like Yeah, him, no? so I, I was, so we were in Dover Lane uh, here when I was in class from two to six. And I think I, I must have gone to a lot of bookstores nearby. I wonder if they still exist. And uh, there was this one particular bookstore where the book owner would always be very happy to see me. He's like, you know, and I would go about from one book to another. He's like, no, 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 just let him be because he is for him. It was Disneyland for me to be in a collection of, you know, books and all. So I think it, it, it all comes from there, I'm sure. It must be so happy to see you here. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So, so, so that was what it was. Then, of course, I read literature. I did my master's in Stephen's from English literature. So writing literature books were, have always been my primary love. Uh, journalism, of course, something that attracted me when I did, once I finished college. I was with CNN and IBM for five years in Delhi. And so Rajdeep and Sagarika, you know, it was wonderful working with that was part of that team. Yeah. It was a wonderful uh, experience. But I think after five years, uh, I felt a sense of ennui. There was something that I wanted to explore something else. Doing stories had kind of become a routine that I knew that I had cracked. Also, I think um, as we see, uh, we are almost same age. And like you actually discover yourself after yeah. 35, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. 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 till about 25 to 35, you're just doing uh, for the sure, doing sure, it. sure. And no, I was enjoying that phase. That also was a uh, is a wonderful phase that I look back with a lot of gratitude. A lot of also, I think a lot of my discipline as a journalist comes handy when I write because research is such a vital part of journalism, and that now comes very handy when I'm writing because all my books have been heavily research based. You know, so a lot of those uh, learnings definitely you know have held me in good stead over the years. So definitely a wonderful part of my life. But like I said, I wanted to explore a new avenue, so I took a one year sabbatical. Okay. completely blank as to what I would do and my mom sitting aghast came my 30 year old son has suddenly left his job and is sitting home and I don't know what he wants to do but uh, he was like Chalo, kuch to kar lega, hopefully and then um, so I was rereading Dan Brown one day and uh, I think it was Angels and Demons and I just felt this weird idea that you know this the way he talks about uh, conspiracy theories or things that are there hidden in, in uh, European history Kuch apna bhi hai kya aisa, kuch in, in, in Indian history, is that something, I, so it, just, it was just a random curiosity, a very random search on the internet and I found this amazing legend called the Nine Unknown Men. Has anybody heard about the Nine Unknown Men? So, it's, so you can go even back and read about it. Of, too much of research, even I never came across. I was like, this is an Indian Dan Brown waiting to happen. How come no one has written a book on it? You know, so it just completely yeah. grabbed my collar and ki likho. And I told him, okay, I'm writing a book. He said, okay, okay fine. Okay. If that if that's what you want to do, mm -hmm. so so that's how it began, you know. So it was I call my book a complete freak of nature because it just happened, it just happened. nothing that was planned or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but once that process, I immersed myself in and I began enjoying that so much. Mm -hmm. And when that book so came as out, as they say, you should have like, like you know a couple of hobbies: one yeah. to earn you money, yeah, and one to one should be your passion, yeah, that yeah, gives yeah. you pleasure, exactly. And one might be for the time pass, for the time pass. So the money part I had left behind. I was just <laughs> sitting and writing a book. Having no idea if this is going to earn me anything, but I did, like I was consumed with that process because it was such a fascinating uh, the the legend the story. It was about okay just to uh, give it a spoiler. It is about Emperor Ashoka, and it is believed that Ashoka after the Kalinga War we all know that he had a change of heart and he went about and he created he he became a Buddhist and he started this whole peace mission. There's a conspiracy theory that he also created something called the Nine Unknown Men, which is in which is the world's oldest secret brotherhood. Who which is, is about Surdas, uh, one of them. Well, that's uh, Akbar. That's Akbar. That's Navratna. Yeah. Huh? Okay, that's, that's separate. Navratna, okay. But this is also nine men. So but, and this is way, way before Akbar. I mean, yeah. you're talking about Ashoka, some yeah. thousands of years before Akbar. Mm -hmm. And he created this world where he assigned nine people with nine sciences, mm -hmm. which he believed were the most destructive. And you know, and they were told okay. to keep these nine sciences hidden. 
from humanity because if they fell in wrong hands there could be you know catastrophe yeah. probably he had used some of it in culling a war himself you know which is where he got the idea that this is very dangerous to be yeah. to be toyed with yeah. so that was the idea and those nine sciences and how you know and they say that this organization is still around is still oh. it keeps change membership keeps changing every year oh and a lot of the uh, people that we know mm. there are names that are thrown randomly they say kalam was a part of it they say netaji was a part of it of course these are all conspiracy theories there's nothing no way to prove or say anything mm. but just the idea of that india was the i think ayan mukherjee got the idea of brahmas from <laughs> maybe <laughs> also no does the idea that india has the world seek oldest secret brotherhood for me i was like fuck dan brown this is what I needs know. to be put out you know yeah. so that's oh, what yeah, that's how the, yeah treasure. yeah yeah and True. that's how the book happened and like she said it did earn comparisons with dan brown because that we are in the same zone and all of that and the book did well and i'm like okay i think this is what i want to do at least for the next so whatever so the passion wala hobby got converted into yeah, the earning yeah, wala hobby yeah, no yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, wonderful <laughs> so as i saw like you i think you uh, started or maybe it had happened by chance that you were writing short stories first yeah, so yeah, that yeah, got featured yeah. with sudha murthy's yes, collection of yes, books yes. and even uh, with the chicken uh, yeah. uh, soup for the soul yeah. so i mean how come then uh, to full fledged stories so was that i mean you were doing short stories along with the uh, along with journalism Yeah, short stories was writing anyways, apart anyways. Uh, al along with my work, and that like you said, it it was getting published in you know these okay. collections. So that, uh, so that was happening parallelly story. anyways, yeah. Okay. But a full fledged novel was something I never planned, and you can't plan a book, you know, it just happens. I, I, that's it what happens. I believe in. You can never really plan a book. Right. It is something an idea that just kind of germinates, and only when it kind of grasps you by the neck and says, yeah. "Sit and, and write." Then only you can write. Yeah, you know, if yeah, someone yeah, just asks yeah. me, um, if, you know, you have you have to write a book on this topic, I cannot. Mm. Yeah, it mm. just happens. Yeah. yeah. wonderful wonderful so uh, now coming back to your writing thing um uh, you have written about you know four to five novels yeah. from we see yeah. in the gestation phase so we see you have uh, explored different genres so biography is one suspense thriller yeah. is one yeah. and then mythology is this even as a screenwriter you're exploring um uh, uh, mythos yeah, yeah. and uh, just tell me how is your experience with different genres yeah. and what are the what's most uh, what gives you most pleasure and uh, what are the challenges you find re respective right, to different right, genres right. i think i enjoy writing in all all these genres i think thrillers is something i have always been very partial to thrillers as a reader i have always loved reading i think one of the first thrillers i remember completely being blown by is um, a lesser known writer called irving wallace who is not as popular as a dan brown but you know seven secret is something that i was completely i was like i had no idea that history can be presented even in this way you know mm -hmm. because suddenly you because one thought of history as a very sacrosanct uh, you know monolith and suddenly irving wallace is completely shatters that notion and tells you that listen there can be an alternate story there can be an alternate version of history now nothing is really sacrosanct and that for me was a huge eye changer and then of course jan brown completely occupied that space you know the way he uh, he also toys in, in in that zone so thrillers i've always loved writing which is my my first two books were thrillers um and then again biography is something i've always loved because i love reading biographies mm -hmm. and uh, so and i i was as a, a reader even i uh, love to explore different genres yeah, like i'm yeah. re really too much into biographies yeah. and even thrillers fiction i started with i think i started with fiction and now i'm into more of uh, exploring india hist india's mm -hmm. history and uh, yes and then when i got to read this mythology and i was just token uh, totally taken yeah. you know yeah. wow yeah. that's it's yeah. another feel of interest right. I i've read devdat uh, patnaik i tried to re yeah. read actually yeah. but it actually did not fall into my uh, mm -hmm. you know channel mm -hmm. so but picking up your book it gave me a very different perspective yeah yeah, yeah thanks so thanks and uh, so we assume that you don't have a particular choice so so these three genres are mm -hmm. ones that i love to explore because mm -hmm. there's something i love to read and also to explore mm -hmm. so and like i said bio uh, biography was something i was i was toying with the idea mm -hmm. and i have i have been a huge sri devi admirer for many many years mm -hmm. and for me it was extremely appalling that there has not been a single book that celebrates mm -hmm. the you know the amazing career that she has had and uh, we know that he actually he started writing on sri devi before Uh, there was any idea of anybody had an idea of that she would be gone yeah, too yeah, soon yeah, yeah, so yeah. i think that must be another yes, challenging yes, we point had spoken to her it was it was like we had spoken to her and both her and boni sir and uh, she was very excited about the book and because 2017 was when i shifted to bombay so oh. it's like a lot of the stars aligned that year because one i shifted to bombay otherwise the book would not have happened 2017 was also shri devi's 50th year in cinema mom had released as a 300th film oh, okay. you know so it was a milestone yeah. year so everything was 
you know, all the pieces place. were falling in place and I met her and she's, she was extremely excited and so was Boni sir. Mm -hmm. But Shri said, you know, Satyat, since Janvi's movie was about to release, Dharak mm -hmm. was about to come out the next year, she said, let's wait for that one because right now all her energies were focused on her daughter's big debut, like any mother would. That's how Indian moms are like. So she's like, Ek bar ye ho jai, and then we'll talk about the film and then of course we'll talk about the book and you know. Mm -hmm. So that was the plan and then of course before that could happen, she suddenly... So I think it must have uh, given a different, uh, you know, a different level of thinking. Had yeah. it been just after her death, yes. your idea of thinking would have been, you know, uh, dedication and yeah, but yeah. Uh, since you started before uh, before her yeah, death, yeah. so it it must be a wonderful no, I, celebration. No, I anyways wrote only after she had passed away. I did not write uh, because like okay. she said, she wanted to wait. Okay. So we had not started writing at all. We were oh waiting yeah. for her and Dharak to release and then the writing would have begun. Right. So I wrote only when she had passed away. Okay. So, um, and I remember that night and it was uh, such a huge shock when suddenly oh, all yeah. of that. And I remember I was like, how do I do this book in her absence? Mm. There's just no way. Mm. And, um, uh, but a, a friend told me a very beautiful thing. He said, you know, you owe this book to her because you had spoken to her about it. Yeah. You have spoken to, uh, you told her about mm. the, how much you love her and all of that so he said do the book <laughs> yeah he said do the book the only difference now is that your book will have a last chapter oh wonderful so i was like wonderful yeah he was yeah, like yeah, that's yeah. true really well so that made so much sense i said yes so this so then of course you pick your uh, kind of fit myself up all over again and then boni sir was a, was a huge support penguin was a huge support right. and then we put the book so then the process became entirely different what would have been just a conversation with her and putting that as the mm. core material in the book mm. now it was about meeting actors, directors, the, the entire fraternity that she had worked with, not just in Bombay, but even down south. Mm. Because down south, she has a solid body of work that not many of us know about. It's an incredible 20-year yeah. journey that she has had down south. Mm. So even before she landed in Bombay, she was already a superstar down south, you know? So right. so that phase of her one career. Of those actors who've been working since, uh, I think, she four was or four. five years. She was four, age. exactly, yeah. exactly. And she still date remains the only actor who was number one mm. simultaneously in Hindi, Telugu, Tamil. Oh, yeah. That has not been achieved. Uh, I. Doubt if it will ever be achieved again. Yeah, I too myself have been a big. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, there was one phase in the 80s when she had become even more powerful than Mr. Bachchan. You know, when oh. Khuda Gawa was being oh. planned, yeah. uh, uh, they wanted her. She said, and she had refused many films with Bachchan because she said, I will only do a film with if I have an equally solid part. And Bachchan films have nothing to do for the actresses except for Ghana Bajana, you know. She had reached a point where she said, after Mr. Indian again, I don't want to do, you know, small roles in movies. Give me an equally solid part. So when Khuda Gawa was being planned, Mm -hmm. they need they knew that this movie the kind of mounting it had it needed that combined wattage of amitabh and shri for the for the film to work at the box office she said i'll do the movie i'll only if you give me a double role and no actor actor a female actor in that time had the guts to demand something like that and she said give me a double role and they had to do it she's the only actress who has a double role opposite amitabh in any film and if you see the climax of khudagawa she is also the only actor who stands next to her in the final climax killing the villain it's always an Amitabh show in the end of every movie. Mm. Only Sri Devi had so that it's star like part. Like uh, Shiv Shakti, you know, if we yeah, say. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so that yeah, book so and yeah. so yeah, so wonderful. And that book also got a lot of acclaim and everything. So, I'm so sure. that was a wonderful uh, book as well. Wonderful. So now, just um, uh, let's discuss briefly about your creative process. As in, I would like you to cover, you know. Uh, what triggers you to write? Is it? Um, I'm sure you would, you know, like said, you won't be having a schedule. Aaj likhna hi likhna hai mujhe, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what, what, how, when are you most creative? At night. Okay. I'm, I'm a graveyard shift writer actually. Oh, right. So I, so you can call me at four in the night, um, the morning actually, and I'll be awake. You can call me ten in the morning and I'll be asleep. Right. So that is my like process. Even I, I somehow. Get most ideas when I'm in the ocean. Yeah, somehow I think maybe because also because of my journalism background where you ha you had long nights, maybe it comes oh. from there. But I find myself most fertile okay. mentally when I'm in writing at night, oh. and there's no one to disturb, and you know you can just sit and there's a you and your keyboard. So that is my process, and I think ultimately it is also about what is the idea that is captured you because ultimately it f like an idea mm. initially comes like a halo at the back of your mind you know it's a small it light does. bulb does, that yeah. that kind mm. of lights up and then mm. you keep feeding upon and as a writer you can have 10 ideas that are swirling in your mind at any mm. given time you know what ultimately takes root what mm. ultimately germinates it happens, yeah. yeah because you, you want to write all those 10 books yeah. but you can't ultimately you, can't. you have to pick and choose one mm. and one idea will ultimately find soil somewhere in your mind right. like out of all the others there's you know? a lot of reasoning also involved yeah yeah, yeah. it would make sense it would find market or not yeah happens yeah i think happens with everyone you know so and what's your path of research yeah like um 
uh, I'm sure all your books are uh, thriller might not be no even the thriller was uh, yeah. is yeah. Uh, history like, based yeah, no? because like I said the first one was about Ashoka so mm. to talk about so that particular and there are seven ch- uh, I think ten chapters in the book okay. that recreate that era with Ashoka right, so right. I wanted so to so give a historical background of the nine unknown men mm. so of course then you have to research about that particular age the, 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 the you know era appropriate characters yeah. and everything of that sort um, of course Sri Devi Sri was Devi complete had research to had to be complete research mm. uh, meeting all those people also, I, had, I was very fortunate. I had a mm. huge stack of magazines that I'd bought as a fanboy, you know, in okay. the 80s and the 90s. Right. And suddenly those became All the stories that used to her come interviews. In interviews. So suddenly that became her voice in the book because suddenly I had th- that is how mm. I could put her, transplant her in my right. biography right. through those interviews. And you could also just, uh, you know, if you came across a story and uh, you could just also find an appropriate person to yeah. approach and then, uh, elaborate. Yeah, yeah, on absolutely. The story. All of that happened. Yeah. And Mahagata, of course, has been a labor of love for five years it took the book to finally mm-hmm. come to shape because one had to go through the entire universe of Puranas mm-hmm. and there are 36 Puranas so let that number first of all so sink just, in. Just came to my mind do you um, I'm sure not as a as a creative person but uh, uh, do you foresee a market to your books like when whenever you're writing a thriller or a biography? No, no, no. I do not. I see the fact that I have written in three different genres mm. is because that's what I write what excites me mm. and I have been told that why don't you stick to one particular genre create yeah. a readership base you know mm. you should like l- the way a lot of authors do mm. I said I can't function like that for me mm. s- like I said something needs to hold me by the scruff of my neck and say mm. write this and I'll do it mm. so I love these three four genres and I keep mm. genre hopping because yeah. so that I, I know I've done Mahagatha right now I don't want to do a my, my thought again I might just go back to another biography which I'm writing anyways right now for right. another actor right. so I'll go back to that or another thriller. I've written a thriller in about five years now. Mm. So I'm going to go back to another thriller. So mm. I, I know if I write a book in the same genre again and again, I'll end up repeating myself. In, in, in a, at least creatively, I'll repeat myself a lot. So I do not stick to that. So I so it's not about the market or whatever, or will the book, because you really can't predict these things, whether a book will do well. Every book has its yeah. own, destiny. own destiny. Ultimately, it's about, as a writer, mm. the only thing you can do is write with full honesty and integrity right. a story that you have formed in your mind. How, how can I be the best vehicle of the mm. story to my reader? you know how can I do that and that's where um, I remember when my first book had just come out The Emperor's Riddles and I was very tense that night because the book was about to come out the next morning Mm -hmm. and I don't know something I just went online Mm -hmm. and went to some weird um, um, tarot site (laughs) so the insecurities of a writer I went to one weird tarot site and I and I kicked in the question, so will my book do well, you know? Yeah. To answer your question about right. market, all of right. that, I think I was in that zone as a, as a debut author. Right. I was some weird, obscure site, but it, what it spelt out was so meaningful. Oh, yeah. It said, your book now has a life of its own. Yeah. Give it up. Oh. Let it be. Okay. And so since then, that, is, that has been the mantra. Like yeah, that has been the mantra. You can write and then you forget about it. Right. Ultimately, the destiny, what path it takes. Yeah, I'm sure, because your second... Um, I mean, Sri Devi's biography was launched by Karan Johar. Yeah. So I think there was no more nervousness after that. Agreeing. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm um, not sure how th- that is connected to the other, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I would have been nervous even if it was any- anyone who would have launched the book. Yeah, it was also launched by Deepika in Delhi. So, so all oh of that okay. has happened. But I mean, yeah, there is always a, a sense of jitters because you you do want a book to do well. You've yeah. put in all of that effort and all of that stuff. Yeah. But I think I'm, I don't check out tarot sites anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so that is definitely not so the case So we just anymore. now can't hold on to talk about your uh, latest one, yeah. the Mahagata. So it's a book uh, which takes you from Satyug to Kalyug. So uh, I think everyone knows there are four yugas. So, and it's like Hindu mythology like never before. I'm not sure how many of uh, you've already read it. But uh, it's a must read and I'm sure you'll finish it in three, four days. So it, it didn't uh, take me longer than that. So it's, it's, it's a collection of hundred tales. Yeah. So tell me a bit about, I'm sure, uh, you know, there are uh, Hindu mythologies vast. So what made you stick to a number of hundred, mm. which um, the prima facie, it looks like a big number. Yeah. But uh, if you compare Vedas and Puranas, it's, it, there's much more. I'm sure yeah. it would yeah, be much yeah, more yeah, than that. Yeah. So, what made you uh, shortlist just hundred uh, stories? So, one of course, um, that's that's only as much time I could give to a book. 
it's also how much you want to write what is your own output yeah. also then there are uh, considerations commercially you know if you put out a 200 uh, uh, yeah. story book it becomes a much thicker book and suddenly produ- uh, publishers are not that willing to touch it because will it sell will it not sell yeah. you know so all of that even I for think this work in many books that yeah yeah even CEO. even for this one i remember yeah. someone advising me why don't you do it as 10 books with 10 stories each instead of just one Ten entire 100 injustice i think i said i'm calling my book mahagatha it needs to have at least 100 stories yeah. only then will it be, the title would be justified yeah. otherwise what's the point of calling it mahagatha Maha right Gatha. so 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 yeah so that's the process like i said it was about entering the staggering world of the puranas and mm. like the 36 puranas mm. 18 mahapuranas 18 upapuranas you know so mm. reading all of that and i think uh, we have all grown up reading and loving mythology hearing mythology i think first mm. of all the first sound is always you hear stories of I from i remember my grandmother like your grandfather even my grandmother had a story for every day yeah. so you know so yeah. uh, mangal so exactly. th- there were exactly. people so and mangal and 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 we used to uh, 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 listen to her on a repeat basis yeah, absolutely you know, because mytho in of. india has always been an oral tradition yeah. it has always been about uh, you know it's then you uh, even puranas initially were an oral tradition that was sent from one generation to the other it was right. orally transferred yeah. the composing and writing of puranas has happened very recently only See, about 500 years back we, i always wonder i mean uh, okay india is a secular country so we don't have mythology uh, in our curriculum education yeah, curriculum yeah. so that's the only way to you know propagate it or maybe uh, carry it Yeah, generations yeah 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 so that's the way uh, which is why storytellers today are so putting out stories and you know they yeah. feel i think there's that vacuum that mm. lo- see we i think we were fortunate that we had a layer of storytellers in our families grandfathers mm. grandparents i think today mm. with nuclear families that layer is missing in many families and at you the know? time when there weren't many books like yeah today yeah. we have options of if we uh, search for mythology we yeah we'll of course we'll be having a lot of content of course of course uh, whatever suits us right but at that time it must have been a really stronger uh, yes. anchor yes uh, yes yes So, like I'm saying, so so you know, so there are um, so so writers like Dev Dutt or Anamish or mm. you know or Anand Nilkanth, and they have, they have this vacuum yeah. is what they are filling. Mm. And I think a generation that we are the younger ones, they want to know about mm. stories. I remember the way when Magatha comes out and the way the kind of uh, feedback that I get from mm. re- they're like, thank you for making us It's making the no no thank you for making the world of Puranas accessible to us because you ah. know the moment you hear about Puranas, mm. it's such a heavy complex word. Mm. It's frightening to enter that world, you know. Yeah. For 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 them that has become an entry point mm-hmm. and the, and the best is through stories because mm-hmm. there is no better madhyam than stories to give out wisdom like you have mm. parables in christianity you know mm. so that is what uh, this book the reason this has become bestseller is because it is and it is cutting through generations so i have feedback coming from young writers and young readers saying thank you for that also older one telling me that now what i'm doing is i'm reading out these stories to my parents mm. so oh. the way they would read our stories when we were kids i am now reading them back these stories from your mm. book so that is such a wonderful thought that it is cutting across generations and across mm. hearts they are giving good table uh, dining table discussion topics i also. hope so i hope like so because the experience yeah i hope so because mm. the puranas have so much to offer right. i mean you know we talk talking about literature created thousands of years back mm. and yet there are themes and stories that are so progressive right. imagine the puranas talk about the lgbt community yeah. you know who would so have thought that's what we uh, like for all of you uh, if you i mean i'm sure you'll be reading the stories so uh, you see so much of relevance from those tales on in our in, in kaliyug so like uh, as you said we have been yeah. talking about lgbt yeah. community role of uh, women you know yeah. how men yeah. are incomplete without women and then dharma and karma yeah. and yeah. very very strong anchors of absolutely like lgbt right. i mean if you could just uh, kind of give a small example like there is this character called buddh now buddh was born uh, out of wedlock because um, buddh's mother tara had eloped with chandra so when she when buddh is born Chandra uh, Tara's wi- uh, husband Brihaspati he curses the child and says you'll be born a neuter mm. so when buddh is born he's neither male nor female mm. and buddh meets a person called ila ila used to be a man called sudyumna who was a mm. king mm. now sudyumna had entered a forest by mistake mm. where shiv and parvati used to meet and you know that was their love spot mm. so shiva had created an enchantment mm. that this forest if anyone enters if any male enters this forest mm. he would immediately become a female because th- he did not want the male gaze to fall on parvati when they were in a state of love making mm. so the moment sudyumna enters he becomes a woman and he falls at shiva's feet and says but lord i am a king my kingdom needs me so do something i cannot be a woman mm. shiva says fine i'll revise and modify mm. this curse you will become you'll stay a man for a month the next month you'll again become a woman so you will keep turning man woman man woman mm. every month so you and finally 
Ila and Buddh marry. So on one hand you have Buddh who has no gender. And on the other hand you have Ila who has both the genders. And this is writing happening thousands of years back. You know, so things like that, the Puranas, the way they talk about the women characters, you know, like a story called of Swaha, that everybody has fallen in love with, discover the story of Swaha. So the gods come to Brahma one morning and say, we are all famished, we have nothing to eat. Brahma says, how is that possible? I have created a very proper system where when humans conduct yagyas down on earth, whatever they pour as oblations in the fire, that will come to you as your food. And then you give them boons. It's a very clear symbiotic process. How come you're not getting food to eat? He said, I don't know. But Agni, yeah. whose job it is to make that transfer possible, yeah. is just not doing it. So, so fumes yeah, or yeah, yeah. Huh. So Agni says, and Agni folds his hands and says, I'm sorry, I don't seem to have the agency to do it. I don't know why. Yeah. So Brahma scratches his foreheads. Yeah. What do we do? And these are huge Mako male gods standing completely helpless. We are famished. <laughs> so suddenly it is a question of survival even for these male alpha gods. Mm. And then Brahma creates a goddess mm. and says, you will be the conduit. Mm. It is your job that when Agni burns the offerings, mm. you will make that transfer possible to us. And he names the goddess Swaha. Mm. And he says, now in every yagya, whenever lines are chanted, mm. at the end of every line, it has to be Swaha. Only when the word Swaha is uttered, will the transfer be possible. And then Swaha and Agnif later marry, yeah, and they're forever united. So, so imagine this one goddess coming as the... Yeah. So the woman has always been the nurturing, the nourishing force in the Puranas. Yeah. So when there is a Rakta Beej, you have to have a Kali. No one else can kill him. Yeah. When there is Mahishasur, you have to have a Durga. Mm. You, the gods just cannot touch him, you know. So the way women are revered, there are stories of Tara and Sangya where they both abandon their husbands because they're not physically satisfied. Mm. And the Puranas don't judge the women. It is the men who come and say, we are sorry. And the fathers also, I think, very supportive. Yeah, the, the men fathers. come and say, we are sorry. Yeah. We should have known better, yeah. you know. So that is the kind of, of course, there are stories like that of Vrinda, yeah. where she burns herself because she feels that her chastity has been lost. Yeah. So we also see that side of patriarchal uh, narrative as well. Yeah. But primarily, it is also about giving women that status. Yeah. So there's a wonderful story about Bhringi and, and Parvati. Yeah. So Bhringi was a huge devotee of Shiva. And so he comes and tells Shiva that, you know, I, I love you so much, I, I w would like to take seven mm. chakras of you. Okay. And Shiva says, of course, mm, why not? I'm sitting here, go ahead. Mm. And the moment he starts circum circumulating, mm. Parvati comes and says, you mm. cannot just do circulate him mm. alone. Mm. Because Shiva is not, is not complete without Shakti. without Shakti. So she comes and she sits, yeah. Ki do, it has to be the both of us. Mm. Bringi says, no, I'm only a Shiva devotee. So he only starts... <laughs> going around Shiva, mm. Parvati inches closer to Shiva. So okay. suddenly it's become an ego battle. Parvati inches closer to Shiva. Mm. He still doesn't. Then Parvati comes and sits on Shiva's lap. Okay. What will you do now? She asks. Okay. <laughs> so what Bringi does is he turns himself into an insect and okay. starts hovering around the <laughs> head of Shiva. <laughs> so Parvati says, oh really? <laughs> then she starts fusing her body with Shiva. Okay. They start becoming one, one body. Yeah. They are the Narishwara. He says, what will you do now? Mm. Bringi still doesn't give up. Look at the height of devotion. He starts tunneling through the flesh. He starts tunneling through the flesh to create a hole so that he can only still fly around Shiva. And now Parvati has had enough. She gets up and says, you just do not, you are blind to the fact that the universe is a combination of male and female. You cannot ignore Shakti and worship Shiva. Yeah. And since you are so fond of the male principle, mm -hmm. so I curse you that you will only have flesh. Because the Puranas say that the flesh comes from the father and the bones come from the mother. Oh, so Parvati okay. says from now on you'll have no bones, only flesh. Oh. And so he falls on the ground, mm -hmm. collapsing as a lump of flesh. Mm -hmm. And then poor Shiva takes pity on him and gives him three legs to stand on. So he stands on a tripod of three legs. Oh. So that's the story. So that is how the Puranas celebrate right. the sacred feminine. Right. Very interesting. Right? And also like uh, this is uh, the relationship of a man and a woman. Yeah. And also you talk about various re relationships like a father-son. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had Father's Day just uh, yes. when my... Yes. So I saw that, uh, you know, could you like to elaborate on... Uh, um, father and son. There are many stories, stories like that, uh, but the, the most interesting I think would be that of Harish Chandra. See, we all know about Harish Chandra as the, the, the Satyavadi, Satyavadi, you know, who, yeah. who, mm. who no matter what stuck to his words and everything and he went through great hardships because mm. of that. 
but prior to that there's another story mm. which is like a prequel to this particular story where uh, harish chandra did not have a son so he starts worshiping uh, the gods and they mm. say you worship varun the god and of the water, water and he will mm. give you a son and varuna comes and says i'll give you a son mm. i have a condition mm -hmm. as soon as he is born you mm -hmm. will give him to me you will mm -hmm. sacrifice him to my name and harishan says what mm -hmm. kind of a mm -hmm. boon is that you are giving me a son and they are taking him away immediately Absolutely. he said but that's my condition okay so he says fine even if mm -hmm. i have few moments with a son even that would be enough mm -hmm. so he says he agrees mm -hmm. so a son is born mm -hmm. and varuna comes and now harishan starts tricking varuna mm -hmm. are he is abhi abhi to paida hua hai he doesn't even have his teeth yet mm -hmm. let him have his teeth mm -hmm. because you know uh, an offer uh, uh, someone without teeth cannot be offered to god that what the puranas say yeah. it's an impure offering mm -hmm. so let him have his teeth you mm -hmm. can take him back mm -hmm. he comes back after he has teeth mm -hmm. but he still hasn't learned anything now okay. let him learn a few the words let him learn a few boy. words so mm -hmm. the so that you see the lo constant love of the father how mm -hmm. he constantly battling with the god and not letting go of his son right. he learns a lot of stuff he mm -hmm. says no but you know but he is a kshatriya Yeah, let him mm. at least learn the art of warfare mm. how can i my son die without learning the art of you know warfare so all of that happens finally mm. this boy grows to a certain age he mm. himself becomes very clever mm. and when varuna comes he, he flees he goes to the forest okay. there's a who okay. sorry uh, out there yeah. but the idea again about the fatherly love and even harish chandra who was supposed to be mm. this complete uh, you know uh, pious and everything even right. he could resort to trickery yeah. when it came to his own he son he could lie so he had yeah. to yeah 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 the, uh, yeah, the yeah. means yeah wonderful and one uh, topic of my interest through your stories is like um, a role of nature yeah it has always been there so which is relevant and i have been researching a lot mm. on nature and i uh, the nature is very interesting so it's interesting you uh, put that out because a lot of the stories puranas uh -huh. what they do is that they um, uh, they give something natural mm. they humanize it they give it a lot of uh, human feelings and emotions like for example the story where the vindhya mountain Mm. he become the mountain becomes is filled with pride mm. when uh, narad is always the perpetual trouble maker oh, so yeah. narad comes and tells vindhya you know i was at sumeru and sumeru is the tallest and the most beautiful mountain in the world mm. immediately vindhya is filled with jealousy how is that possible mm. so vindhya star overnight vindhya goes high up mm. and so high that now the sun can't travel around the earth right. so suddenly there's one half of the earth is complete darkness the other half is complete sunlight mm. and there's chaos and all the gods come and tell vindhya you this is madness he said i don't care now i am the tallest mm. so you know and then ultimately they call a saint called august and august they very cleverly comes and tells the mountain listen he first praises the mountain because he know that's what will get flattery will work here he says listen you are the tallest of course mm. i need to go south and i can't mm. climb you just so high oh. do me a favor just low your slopes for me mm. I'll be gone. I'll be back in a jiffy. Mm. Then you can again go mm. high up. And Vindhya is very fond of the flattery, so he mm. completely goes down. So we see this trickery and trickery has been there ever since. Ha! Huh, but it is again about mm. the purpose. Like, what is mm. the intent behind mm. what he is doing? Mm. And moment the mountain lowers itself, mm. um, uh, Agastya crosses itself, and Vindhya says, "Come back soon." He mm. says, "Fine." Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and Vindhya is still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Still hasn't come back. <laughs> Ever since then. So many stories. There's a story where the Ketki flower, yeah. you know, Ketki flower uh, tells a lie. So mm. th that is cursed. There's a yeah. story where the sun, mm -hmm. you know, the sun is filled with jealousy. There's mm -hmm. so the moon is filled with jealousy. The moon, for example, the story about the moon, where the moon marries the twenty-seven daughters of Daksha, mm -hmm. who are the twenty-seven oh, nakshatras. Oh, that's very interesting yeah. story. Yeah, but he only loves one of them. Mm. So Daksha curses the moon mm. that if that is how you are, if you're so mm. proud of your beauty mm. that you can't see. the beauty of my daughters mm. i curse you that you will mm. lose all your beauty mm. you will turn dark mm. and the moon starts turning dark mm. then he prays to shiva and mm. shiva says fine i'll modify the curse mm. you will be dark for 15 days mm. and you will then you'll again get your light for 15 so the fact the moon waxes and wanes mm. is now is comes from is connected to this story so, so many satya stories where see, nature plays a very important satya we see that all these things like you know as we say kaam krodh lo mo ahankar and uh, all the evils they had been there ever since yeah, yeah. so how do we uh, differentiate satyug from kalyug like this 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 question has been in my mind for a week now so everything i think uh, we are much more blessed now don't you feel like there are no more catastrophes no, like definitely uh, not uh, more blessed you know, it, now uh, <laughs> satyug is called satyug for a for a reason yeah, it's about the numbers see uh, of course you had demons and you had gods even back then across every yuga you've had the asuras and you had the devas mm. but it is about what was the what was the world view that was ultimately dominating every yuga and the world view back then was a lot more purer was a lot more simpler was a lot more about there was a lot more compassion uh, mm. there the puranas very clearly state that um, dharma is like a four footed bull 
in sat yuga dharma was standing on all four feet and every foot symbolizes something good like piety you know like compassion mm. like truth like cleanliness like penance like austerities mm. something or the other mm. moment you come to treta yug mm. the bull loses one foot so now okay, you're in now in treta yug the bull stands three. dharma is standing on three legs mm. in dwapar yug dharma stands on two legs now in kali yug is the poor thing is only standing on one leg one, I mean, what so it's definitely not a better we we're not in a better place or it's not a uh, nicer uh, right. time for dharma itself right. so we are going hoping that once kalki comes back as mm. has been predicted mm. and he will again start satyuga mm. so dharma will again be like back i could personally connect a lot of kali yug with satyuga and you know even dwapar and treta yug so i think uh, there we had like proclaimed okay asuras and uh, devtas and yeah. danavs yeah. and now i think it comes through astrology maybe we have rakshas gan uh, dev gan manushya gan little bit of those elements not not very blatant that see, i see see like i said it was a world view so all mm. these sciences were interconnected interlinked so i'm mm. sure a lot of the cultural uh, artifacts would have there would have been a hemorrhaging of uh, you know constant um, uh, cross pollination among all these sciences would have been happen so if there is mm. a uh, asur yo, uh, yoni or a uh, rakshas yoni mm. it would have come Derived, some derived some from some the some mytho, yeah. of course, but I d I don't see a very mm. clear connection to stories where something has been illustrated mm. this way. But I'm sure they were all I impacting each other. I think that's the beauty other. of uh, like you don't give uh, moral of the story or anything like that. Yeah. That's the oh, beauty th of it. I was completely. We, I, I said this is not a moral science book. Yeah, this is I not something where I'm actually intrigued my brain. Absolutely. You know? uh, okay, so I told the this? I told the publisher why that not? I want my readers to engage with the stories themselves. And I'm sure everyone would connect. Yeah, yeah. Because what is nice about the Puranas is that the Puranas, you know, they are completely grey. They do not. give you anything as black and white mm. so at the end of every story mm. you have it is up to you your own moral compass your own world view what mm. side you choose right. like i was telling about the story of ram so ram mm. kills a shudra in ayodhya mm. and he has to do that because the shudra is chanting the vedas and in that particular in treta yuga mm. the um, the you know the the shudra class were not supposed to chant the vedas mm. so because of what he was doing it was believed that as creating unrest in the praja and it's also causing deaths so ram comes and kills the shudra mm. now you can now there is enough to be said on both the sides ram as king he oh, his duty is like to yeah. his people it's and dharma versus karma yeah think, but yeah. then on the other hand you can say mm. this is this is also about caste oppression yeah, yeah, so suddenly you can why why are you barring a particular mm. caste from the vedas you know so, so so the so the puranas are see we talk about 50 shades of gray puranas are 500 mm. million shades of gray oh, that is what they are yeah, yeah. and it is so <laughs> difficult to choose at the end of every story you're confused so i'll tell you one story in fact there are many char uh, characters mm. who in fact because of this very reason mm. they refuse to take sides they refuse to give an opinion because mm. they know it's it's morally it's always mm. a moral dilemma mm. the story of of a person called satyatapa mm. satyatapa was a rishi and once and he supposed to be very wise rishi so indra and vishnu decide to test him mm. let's see how wise he really is so indra takes the form of a boar mm. he comes and he takes three chakkar of satyatapa and he runs away towards the hills Vishnu comes as a hunter and says I have to kill this boar did you, do you know where it went because if you don't kill the boar my family will die of starvation mm -hmm. now for the uh, so for the hermit it's a moral dilemma whom do i save mm -hmm. if i say where the boar went the boar will die right. if i don't say where the boar went mm -hmm. his family will die so then he decides to not mm -hmm. involve himself mm -hmm. he says i have the answer to your question mm -hmm. that i don't have to say anything So he says what does that mean mm. you don't have to say anything he mm. says i'll tell you i'll explain to you why mm. he says my eyes mm. have seen where the boar went but my eyes can't speak can't speak okay my tongue can speak but my tongue hasn't seen where the boar went <laughs> so since my eyes and my tongue have done their respective duties <laughs> i don't need to do anything else right. and then vishnu and indra come and say you are really wise the what they say about you is true so this constant moral dilemma and to take a side to give an opinion has always been a problem in the puranas that is what makes it so relevant mm. and so human because we are all living a gray zone we are, we are constantly talking about packages that are not black and white mm. so this very messy world is what the puranas are oh. which is why they are so relevant and so today right. Right. so i see uh, uh, let's leave you know the readers to discover more and your interpretation please yeah. share your views whenever uh, you finish the book so uh, that just uh, leads me to my next question so have you ever come across any uh, this um, curtails to all your all the books you written so far so any uh, review or comment that you uh, found was like you know a good or bad experience regarding the views and comments from the readers uh 
like i would say talking about no no in general in general as a as an author if uh, what is your no, experience for mahagatha especially there has been this whole right wing criticism that why you're calling this mythology okay. that is the debate that has been going on for so many years you know why right. this is your hamara sanatan dharma this is history because i feel mythology history, history and astrology i found a new they're the way clever yeah, even yeah, science yeah. and for me i was very clear that i see them as mytho because mm. i first of all i think history is a very different mm. discipline history for me moment you equate something moment you make a value judgment that a mm. history hai mytho nahi hai you are denigrating mytho you giving yeah. it a lesser position than history which is mm. actually incorrect mm. because history is a very time bound thing history is about dates mm. history about ad and bc and within that you have whatever you have mytho is timeless mytho yeah. is sanatan how can you put brahma vishnu mahesh in a historical timeline you know how does that even work right. okay so also history for me too. history for me also has a sense of arrogance because history mm-hmm. says i know because i have the evidence to prove mytho doesn't want evidence it only wants your faith and belief mm. so when i when i look at the spectacle of the ganga falling on the head of shiva i mm. don't know if that happened i have no evidence to prove it mm. but the spectacle gives me goosebumps and i think you now uh, join mytho wars for uh, more yeah. it's, it's the new uh, i won't say trend is a very shallow word for it uh, it's it's the new area that even filmmakers are exploring you know uh, so um, yeah, we saw a glorious example last week didn't we <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Another will come. Another will come. So okay. So even mytho has to be done right. It has to be given the sort of dignity. You can inquire. You can interpret. But the moment you lose I the dignity it of what it is, that is worse than science right. and history. Yeah. 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 You know. So just uh, the the yeah history. yeah. So uh, I mean, uh, we know that he's been writing uh, for a long time. Now he's also venturing into uh, movies and uh, content for ODT. So I uh, rest my questions here and I leave the house open for questions. I I can see there are many. Thank you so much. It's been a very, very interesting evening, and there's so much more. I have two things to say. First, I need to compliment that these are stories and not words of heavy wisdom. I work as a psychologist, and even when I'm dealing with patients and clients, whenever I tell them it's a story, they drop everything and they listen attentively. So this book can be therapeutic as well. so i'm trying to look at you know my personal gain uh, so that's something i really really need to compliment and there's so many podcasts and so many apps you know which have these stories for adults and they uh, so that's a great contribution which you'll probably realize in the coming years <laughs> second question is that you've lived with this book and research for 5 years you've literally lived with the entire thing what kind of transition did satyarth have the person he was and the person he's become so what was the impact because that's going to now show in your future work so i'm very curious to know that <laughs> i i have been i have been asked that question and i was not sure what i had answered um i think one thing i definitely uh, can put a finger on is that it has definitely made me a more patient person you know i remember because i i i was I could see a certain impatience in my writing in my process in my research in my earlier books I think moment so a sense of jo therav jise bolte hain that I think has come in also because like I said it needed 5 years for me to marinate in this world to absorb this world uh, you know to enter this zone and to like I said I, it was like a deep dive into this world of puranas and then to look for this these 100 pearls you know yes. so so the idea was to be how patient could I be and then writing and rewriting because I wanted it see I did not want that when i'm presenting something like this to a new generation of readers i did not want that the essential wisdom the essential quality the core values those had to be respected when i'm putting it out for the others to read Absolutely. of course these stories also inquired and they also have a sense of you know examining stuff but the the the, the, the very atma of the stories had to be retained so i think right uh, addressing that needed a sort of patience i think i think that is something i can definitely say i do so see therapy is set in there huh? <laughs> therapy is already set maybe, in there maybe maybe you're right yeah so another thing is you know when you read mythology sometimes you get a sense of entitlement ship so i'll give an example is one of my sessions i had this female and you know she was going through a little trouble times and then she came up and said something like main to insaan hu sita ko bhi to agni pariksha deni padi thi to it's okay so you know because you read these 
lot of people start feeling entitled that because it happened to so and so and they were gods and they could be pardoned so we are humans so that is a very interesting take on this have you thought about that not really, no, not <laughs> until, not until you, you had kind of mentioned it. It mm -hmm. is actually very interesting and yeah. you're right, a lot of the stories where what you do kind of place yourself in that situation, even subconsciously sometimes. Even Absolutely, you know, because they it. say, uska bhi toh affair tha, tab yeah. affair tha, yeah. ab tha, yeah. so yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. so these are things like I which... I remember I had a session in Delhi when I speak about these women's stories. Yes. So this woman asked me, so where have we lost the plot? What has happened <laughs> 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 You know, so, so definitely you do get a yes. sense of so kinship, that yes. is immediate kinship. Yes. Yes. immediate point of reference that you did not know existed you know yeah. so so I get that but I think that is again the charm of the Puranas what makes them so relevant and futuristic yes. and all of that is that it makes you question it makes you, um, you know, it just transports you in, in a different world and it puts you and it so many blinkers absolutely blinker yeah. opens up and you're like yeah. okay there are possibilities to be explored so I thank you so much thank you, thank thank you. you. Hello. So my question was relating to the fact that you've spent so much time with the Puranas. So in the Puranas, it's like that Mahavishnu. It's like, uh, you know, there are many more universe. Yes. And like when movies like Spider-Man are made with the multi-dimensional, yeah. uh, you know, multiverse happening. So, you know, what is your, after reading the Puranas, what did, like, did you feel and when Spider-Man came out? So do you think that, you know, there's some space over there because right now multiverse is really big yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. no I, I get your question um, again it has to be like I said it ha it's ultimately in the writing how a filmmaker can take this and how what kind of with dignity and with all of that how can you make it interesting and how can you make it cool how can you approach because see the Puranas when you see the kind of imagination you, you mentioned Vishnu there's a story where Vishnu and Rama are fighting and who's the superior among the two so Brahma says, why don't you enter me and see what I am? And Vishnu enters Brahma and what he sees is staggering. You know, he sees worlds upon worlds. He sees skies and oceans and this entire, it's staggering. He comes out and says, wonderful. Why don't you now enter me and see what I encompass? And Brahma then enters Vishnu and he sees multiverse upon multiverse, you know. So this is that the zone where all of this is happening so you're right we definitely in that space Vishnu the kind of avatars Vishnu has had over the ages and then avatars that we didn't even know existed I didn't know there was something called a Hayagriva avatar of Vishnu which is half human half horse head and he plays a very vital role in many stories you know so there is so there are possibilities there are a whole host of possibilities but ultimately it is like when Ayan Mukherjee launched the book in Bombay someone asked him why don't you make a series out of 100 episodes he said Maybe, maybe. We'll have to see what can be extracted, what can be derived and what can be taken well. Maybe also within the Brahmastra zone, what can be imported from this book. That is again the conversation that I have had with him. You know, so there are definitely possibilities, uh, but it has to be seen with a certain lens where you are, first of all, like I said, you keep the material intact, but also you make it palatable, interesting and visually cinematic when you make that transfer. So all of those verticals have so to be... So you did delve into that zone? Yeah, so I, I mean, one gets conscious of that while writing, that this is a zone where there are... There is no one monolith, you know, everything like Vishnu has 10 avatars, 20 avatars. Yeah, Shiva but has all so the many avatars forms. we know of are all the avatars he took on Dharti. Not all of them. Hayagriva, uh, I don't think ever have appeared on Dharti. Yeah, but it has been in the sky. Yeah. So the Mohini avatar, again, we, do, we forget about Mohini, the, f the only female avatar Vishnu take. I didn't know Shiva had an avatar called the Sharab. So what happens when Narsimha, we know about the story of Narsimha, right? He kills Hiranya Kashipu. What happens, we don't know what happens after that. So after the uh, demon is killed, Narsimha is filled with bloodlust because he has tasted blood. He goes about the universe roaring and almost tearing the universe apart. So how do you calm Vishnu who is Narsimha? Shiva comes as Sharab. Sharab is this gigantic bird with 1000 wings and 1000 talons. He picks up Narsimha, goes all the way up and then drops him down and Narsimha falls and dies and then Shiva Yeah, I've read about Shiva. this one, yeah, okay. yes so, you know, so, so imagine Shiva having a Sharab avatar yes. imagine a fight between and I am like, how would this look cinematically? Sharab and Narsimha fighting I said, yeah, that's the beauty of the Puranas there's so much within our own universe why do we need to make anything Marvelian or Decian when we have so much already? so, yeah thank you, thank you. Next question. Yeah. Weeks and weeks oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like my producer, Maithavar says, it requires sadhana. That's the word. That's the word. <laughs> yeah, but the problem is there are people around who are not willing to, you know, give it that much time. Uh, 
every time I hear an author talking about mythology or related to that, one very interesting thing which you discussed today was trickery with a purpose. Yes. Yeah. And I think entire mythology, every place there is trickery with a purpose, which is very interesting, especially, you know, when you have to explain it to your children. Yeah. Or like the grandparents explained it to us. I find that uh, part very, very interesting. Yes. And I hope uh, you have covered those. A lot, a lot of, of, lot of, lot of it. it. Because, you know, when I was uh, narrating some stories from Mahabharat. Because I, I, I don't know much about Puran, but from Mahabharat. Krishna Pura uh, Mahabharat me is trickery, trickery with a purpose. So, uh, like it is about the end justifying the means it has to be for the the intent has to be noble like there is a very funny i think the one of the funniest stories in the collection is when ravan he gets this huge shivling and he says i'll take it all the way to lanka mm -hmm. and uh, shiv says if you can take it all the way to lanka fine mm -hmm. just don't make sure you don't put it down anywhere if you put it down it will take root there then you won't be able to dislodge it anymore mm -hmm. he says not a problem i'll walk all the way to lanka so he uh, puts it on his head and he's walking and, and now all the devas are petrified because if Ravan installs that shivling in Lanka, Lanka would become invincible. So what do we do? So all the gods have a hurried conference, ki, Are ye to ja hai, kya kare? how do we stop him? He says, hey, kaam karte hai na. you know, na, if someone has to urinate, he has to stop. <laughs> so he says, Varun Dev, why don't do something about it? And then Varun creates some magic and suddenly poor Ravan has to urinate and he's walking. He says, maybe if I walk fast, but now he has to stop. What do he can't put it down, what does he do? He says, Narad coming. He says, Narad, please hold this shipping for a while. Make sure it doesn't touch the ground, okay? And I'm coming in five minutes. And he goes, and Narad looks up and winks at the girls and he <laughs> sits down. So trickery, but the intent is noble, right? So yeah, a lot of that in the, in the Puranas, yeah. So this took me uh, years back when we would sit for Bhagwat sessions and it, it is pure nostalgia yeah. and I'm going to market it to the next generation saying this is 50,000 shades of grey like you said. Thank you. So now uh, can you tell me the difference? You are a great storyteller. What's the difference between writing a book and screenwriting because you're doing both? Yeah. So can you just throw some light? To I'll tell you the, 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 the greatest difference that I learned myself the hard way. So I remember when I was writing Porus, I there was this scene that we had to create where Porus has to escape with his whole family. And I wrote in my mind the greatest possible scene. It had all sorts of action. There were huge props and I created a huge, because this is happening on the banks of the Saraswati River. So I created this huge, there's this huge, um, um, what do you call that? The watchtower. That, that, that watchtower falls in the river. The river creates a whole flood. The entire land is flooded and within that chaos and everything, Poros escapes. And I go back saying, Are, dekho kya scene likha hai. And my producer looks at the scene and says, Haan, achha hai, lekin hamare paas Transformers ka budget nahi hai. Okay. So then you realize, even then, no, but even then. So then you realize what very vital difference is that when you're writing for, when writing a book yourself, your imagination can go as high as you want. But when writing for television, there are certain constraints that what can be achieved on screen. That for me was a huge learning that day that something has to be. So there is, there are certain boundaries, there are certain rules, there is a certain budget within which one has to operate. So what is achievable on screen is what you write on paper. So that was a huge, huge. Thank you. Uh, one question. Uh, the language, like the way you are putting it in, because you have been so absorbed in the Puranas, so taking that into consideration and what has recently been coming up, and now it is, you know, they are rolling back, like you have to omit all these dialogues yes, and yes. what is your take on that? No, I think I completely agree. You see, like I said, there has to be a certain dignity. You know, the concept of an epic, if you look at classical literature, whether it's Milton's Paradise Lost or whether it's, uh, you know, Iliad and Odyssey, one thing always associated with an epic is the word sublime. Anything to do with epics, has, there has to be an effort, a concept of sublimity about it. And sublime means a certain grandeur, a certain larger than life. So moment you have, you, so you promise me that, you promise me ten commandments and then you show me Monty Python's life of Brian, you know, or you show me something, then it's not acceptable, right? Then you say that, no, we are spoofing Ramayan, you to spoof Banayam. Then I accept that, right? You be honest, honest with what are you putting out as a because there are so many ways in the West. You've seen people spoofing Christ, spoofing the mythology, and you accept that because you know what you're going in for. 
you, you can't show me this and you give me that, so. <laughs> So uh, you're obviously you're working very diversely. You've worked very diversely. So uh, I was just curious, do you ever work together on parallel projects? Because for myself, when I'm writing a book, I can just write that one book. So I was very curious that because Sri Devi was uh, 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 released in 20, uh, 2019, I think. Yeah, yeah. And it seems you were already working on Mahagatha. Yeah. So was it like, can you do parallel projects together? How do you no, switch I on? No, I actually and can't. I actually can't. I do prefer to write one book at a time. Mahagatha, the since there are 100 stories, I had written 20 already before the Sri Devi because I had, not, I had no idea that Sri Devi would happen. Mahagatha began when I was still in Delhi. So I was, began writing about 10, 20 stories, showing it to my agent and all of that who was at that point, my literary agent. And so he went through it and we had a certain plan for that book. Then, like I said, the stars were in place and suddenly I found out that I'm going to Bombay. Suddenly it was a possibility to me. So I left that in the middle and I went to the Sri But I would very much prefer to write one book at a time. I cannot write yeah. two books. And, uh, unfortunately, now with the web series happening and with uh, this new biography that I'm writing, with that happening, plus HarperCollins now wanting a sequel because Mahagat has done so well, suddenly I'm being pulled in three, four directions and suddenly you realize ki achha, but how do you manage that? Something, Satyat, when you're writing for the, it's all right, I don't know. When you're writing for the web series and when you're writing your book, is it somewhere where you bifurcate between this is my passion project and this is like work, work because or you know, no, 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 no. I think it has to be passion has to be a, uh, whatever you do. It has to be everything has to be a passion project. Yeah, the sure. fact that I am in Mythoverse is because I wanted to be a part of that space mm -hmm. where they want to take Mytho, Indian Mytho and put that in web series or in films and give it up, you know, put that. So that for me is an exciting space to be in, you know. So for me, it is equally exciting when I'm there in office at work and when I come back home and I work on another Mytho, Mahakatha. So I, so just doing two different things. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Also, that's Sharmishta. She also has come out with a new book. So I think all I would urge all of you to check it out. It sounds extremely interesting. So please. Okay. Yes. I had a question. I, I firmly believe that uh, the Puran, Puranas and the Vedic people, yeah. well, they were not from this planet. Because their, yeah. their capacity to be so intellectual mm. uh, has not been seen after that. Right. In numbers, yeah, you know, you yeah, can see yeah. it in one person, mm -hmm. but not in like Homer could have been the one person, but mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. Did you get this feeling? <laughs> when you were no, that is actually a theory that says that we all were seeded by aliens. That there was this one race that came to Earth, and you know they were the super the supermen. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. And they seeded, which is why there are so many similarities across civilizations around the world, you know, because they all came from a common stock, which was an alien stock. So those, and they had superpowers, they had these amazing superhuman <laughs> weapons, which we now see as a Trishul or Sudarshan Chakra. So that is a very, uh, very popular theory within Mytho writers that ye be. So what you're saying kind of echoes that very much, that, you know, it could possibly Why be. Did it die out? <laughs> As I think as all good things after a point get corrupted, you know, beyond a point when you once you have, you start taking over the earth, a lot of other urges start taking over, you start becoming more and more human. You, at one point you were more superhuman, now you have a lot more human and then you start getting diluted. So I guess, so that that's why. Nobody would have read this now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually, yeah. But like they say, Puranas, the hope that you get is that everything is cyclical. So if the four yugas keep coming and going, coming and going, so if you are at the very peak of uh, Kali Yuga, they say we will go back to Satya Yuga if, the, if one can take some solace from that. Uh, in fact, the book ends, Mahagatha ends in Kali Yuga, where uh, at the end of it, Brahma is being asked by Janme Jai that now that we are in Kali Yuga, and I am the first king of Kali Yuga, the second king, sorry, uh, his father was the first Parikshit. He says, is there something that you can give me in Kali Yuga that will give me some sort of hope? It will give me and my people some hope. He says, there is one good thing about Kali Yuga that was not there in the other three Yugas. He said, what is it? He says, in the other three Yugas, if you retrospected and inward, if you went and you did a lot of self-analysis and all of that, you earn a little merit. You had to do years and years of self-analysis and you would earn a bit of merit. In Kali Yuga, it's the exact reverse. Do a, just a bit of self-analysis and retrospection, you will earn loads of merit. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So now it's the exact ulta. So if you, so if all of us can go back and do just that, lot more. <laughs>
so that is one hope that we have in Kali Yuga. And now we see our babies are not born with animal heads and, you know, some, some, you know, to that extent, destruction. I mean, I'm in awe of Kali Yuga, totally. <laughs> Okay, After so some great work, what work do you give yourself? I mean, I'd like to know a lot about behind, like after you've done some great work, you do something great, what is it you like to reward yourself? I think I just look for another exciting adventure right after. Because one feels a certain vacuum once once had done something. You s right now I'm still soaking in all the love that's coming for the book, all the all the joy. Uh, all the good numbers. I, I think I've got, got my first biggest royalty check for Mahagatha <laughs> ever since my books have come out. Okay, that's a session that we need to have individually, <laughs> you and me. <laughs> that's not for public consumption. <laughs> uh, I think nobody wanted this session to end, yeah, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but all good, <laughs> all good things needs to end. It was just wonderful, Satya. Thank you so much for enlightening all of us. And I guess when we read the book, we'll all come to know more about it. On behalf of the foundation, I really thank you to be here. And most welcome. And Isha for taking your time. Come all the way from Missouri to <laughs> do this conversation and do the research. Uh, on behalf of the foundation, I thank both of you. I would also like to thank our patron, Sri Cement Limited, um, Taj Bengal for being the hospitality partner, and my Kolkata for being the media partner for the session. Last but not the least, the enchanting audience, who is really, you enjoyed it, you, you also let the author feel very comfortable. Your curiosity and open minds fill the creative endeavors of countless authors. Your love for literature shapes the very foundation upon which we stand today. Thank you for your unwavering support and for being the keepers of stories. Now we have a special giveaway made in the beautiful Dokra. I would like to request Vinita Morji to please come and felicitate Satyat. Thank you so much. You can uh, please come and take uh, one book and Satyat will be happy to sign the book.